So if anybody was at the CIFA conference <laughs> and came to the archives workshop, this is like a mini version of that. So you can just have a little snooze. But what we're going to do is get to the point quicker and hopefully flag up some of the things that we really want as takeaways. Um, this project is the second of some projects that have been funded by Historic England, plus Arts Council England in the first stage, looking at a solution to our archives problem that we all love and know about um, and have done for a very long time. Um, and what we're looking at is archive solutions in England. So this talk is really about what's going on in England, but it definitely does have um, implications, let's say, for how we deal with archives, let's say, across the world. Let's be bold. <laughs> But also, um, we've been consulting with uh, other nations as well as we've been doing this to look at how people deal with stuff. So this isn't a completely England-focused project and exercise, but the solution that we're talking about is about England. Um, so the project is Options for Archives. This is the first stage of the project. I'm going to do a really quick summary through. I've put the first page of our detailed report on here. So if there's anything where you think like, where did they get that from? You can find out because there's probably an appendix with all the data in. Um, we should also say as well that this is a, a kind of a quick um, wrap up of what, where we are at the moment. We're in the middle of the project. This isn't the end, if you like. These aren't the final solutions and, and recommendations. And anyway, it's not up to us. We're going to be putting together a report which will be going back to Historic England. We've got a series of three workshops, which I'll put the dates on for the weekend. They're online workshops. We're looking at target audiences of consultants, uh, planning and HERs and project managers, not the archives teams. We've been talking to archives teams and they know this project really well. What we want to do is talk to the people in this audience about um, what we think we think would be a good solution because it's to do with money. <laughs> and um, that's something that we really have to do think about. So there is a report. You can find it on the Dig Ventures website. Um, what we did in the first phase included desk-based review. It included survey, consultation, case study reviews. It was a lot of work. And what it came together in the end was a series of recommendations. Um, but interestingly, it's worth reflecting on where we started. So we did a desk-based review of all the surveys, including the FAME survey from 2012, various smaller projects as well that have looked at different aspects of this. And we looked at all the recommendations that everybody's made and found that there were some very common ones that everybody said. What we need is a national strategy for archaeological archives. It would be very helpful to have a national index, for example, that was publicly accessible, a standardised framework for archives management. So we kind of just have to work out how to do something once rather than in every single region we work with. Um, a blended solution that involves museums, but also off-site storage because we know capacity is a huge problem. And also a consideration of the deposition fees and what that covers and how much it is. So this is this was before we started. <laughs> that was the desk-based review. What we found out was, yes, those recommendations were all right. Strangely enough, what we thought 10 years ago was still relevant. So a nationally coordinated national collection, something that has a, a physical national repository, a big warehouse that you can put stuff in would be useful, but something that's got a digitally accessible archive that actually pulls that information together of where things are that's publicly accessible, but something also that has that standardisation as an approach that is the same for every archive that we put together. Um, so what we came up with is the idea of the National Collection for Archaeological Archives. I, I know Duncan's spoken about this in this forum, and I think it was only, was it last year? So this should be like, oh yes, of course, we've heard of this. Um, so we don't need to go into it in great detail. Um, the thing that we wanted to kind of emphasize though, is it's more than just a place with shelves in, it's more than a warehouse. Um, this is something that guarantees public benefit. So we want to link it through to impact, benefit, the social side of what we do. Um, it needs to be discoverable and accessible. It's about enabling people to do research, to use archives, to get more from project legacy. Um, it's looking at the reuse of resources, but it's also providing that seamless interface between the data we collect, the materials that we gather, 
and select appropriately and the organisations and communities that we then work with. So it's a concept and it's an idea. It has lots of things to do with it. Centralised web, catalogue, an index, a data store, effectively, and, and quite a clever one that scrapes data from other places, is interoperable with Heritage Gateway, with ADS, with where we put our information. Um, standards that everyone can use the same standards for, for archaeological collections, um, so not based on the individual collection policies, perhaps, of uh, regional museums, things that are about the kind of material that we collect. A single point of online access. This is really important, which is why we keep talking about it. Um, and an underpinning collection policy. So this is the material we want to collect. This is the stuff we're interested in. This is how it then links in with um, standards, guidance, the way we do things. Um, and something that's collaborative and includes the creators of the archives. So it's about what we all want to do with that material and how it, we get access to it. As well as being the warehouse with the shelves and the things and the collections and the standards, this would also have regional support networks. And the idea, um, as we're proposing, it would have almost like your kind of expert advisors as, as part of the team. So there's people that can help talk between the people collecting the data and the end repository, which may well be the museum you've always used, but you're kind of th through hot point would be through this uh, national collection. So hopefully that would kind of smooth out some of the issues. So the big coloured squares are the main points about the NCAA. Single catalogue, collections policy, standards and a core team with archives advisors. So similar to the model of the Historic England Science Advisors where there are people that will answer the phone, <laughs> answer a question and helpfully move things on. Um, whose job it is designed to be that person, if you like. They're not trying to run a museum at the same time. They're not trying to do all these other things. And they understand the archaeological material and where it's coming from. So the job of the last phase, as well as to kind of come up with an idea that feels like it would work, would to think, well, how big does it actually need to be? What is the physical space required? Um, again, coloured squares, that's where information is. This is the kind of information we got. It's, an, it's not a great science, it has to be said. So this is looking at all of those surveys, all of the reports, the, the amount of work we do collectively, but also how much stuff is already in store. Now we have got good data about that because we've got those surveys and I don't think a huge amount has changed except the numbers have probably gone up. Um, what's gonna happen in the next five years? What's gonna happen in the next 30 years? Because actually when we talk about in per perpetuity, which I still can't quite say, that's about the generation length that we're thinking about. Like, Actually, what happens if more museums close? What happens if museums hear about this and think, oh, well, can we put all the stuff in our stores in that collection as well and just keep the stuff that we want to have access to as part of our curated contents? Um, so, so we just kind of thought about that and through that process, we've come up with some figures. How we came up with these numbers are in that report um, and it's really interesting <laughs> to go and read it. Um, also, through uh, Sam's uh, research, she found this quote from 1904, good old Flinders, what we need is a big warehouse for all our stuff. That didn't happen. <laughs> Look where we are today. So I think one of the things, without being too flippant about it, is like it, it was recognised early on that something like this would be useful as a sectoral solution, if you like, something that we can all use together. And if we'd have had that store for 70,000 boxes at that point, think how much room you would have in your offices today. So options, we came up with three different options, one in the middle that's two slightly different models. There's detail about all of those options in the reports. The one that we pushed and recommended was for this single national solution for England. And that's the one that's kind of comes through the recommendations and you heard about from Duncan. So at the end of this um, project, the discussions are still in progress. Again, no decisions, no big things are happening apart from the fact that this is the one that's been heard and, and people want to kind of look forward in. We've worked out that that would need capital costs of between 56 and 65 million just to get things up and running and off the ground. We think it would be just shy of 2 million a year to run, to actually keep that, that 
staff team around it to keep the building running, to maintain the infrastructure. Sounds like a lot, but we're, we're a big sector actually, and we, we have a lot of boxes. <laughs> um, the current project is looking at, can we raise that as a sector? Can we sustainably support that level of infrastructure without it being a bit bonkers? So that's what we're looking at now. And we're doing the cost models appraisal, still focused on England. Sam's leading the project. I'm helping out and we're doing it with Sally and Quinton at Cambridge as well. So it's the project team that worked on the last phase. And now Sam's going to tell you about money. Yeah, so what we've been asked to do is to figure out, can we sustainably sort, support this national collection that's been proposed? And people at the right high levels are talking about it, but they want to know, can we support it as a sector? We're not talking about the initial build cost. They haven't asked us to talk about that. <laughs> we're talking about the yearly... Can we sustain it, create this all singing, all dancing, accessible, wonderful um, collection that is benefit to society and us as a sector? So the first thing we wanted to do is look at what are we currently spending on archiving at the moment? Now, this is going to be quite a quick talk. If you come to one of our, one of our workshops, I'll go through the figures that we've collected in more detail. So I'm going to try and just hit the key points so we drive home some of the things we really want people to take away. So went out to the sector and collected data on the cost of archiving as we see it at the moment. Now, it's the first time this data has been collected. It comes with a lot of caveats. For example, some people just wouldn't give me the data. They didn't want to give me information on how much they'd spent on projects. I made it completely anonymous. I just sent out, um, you know, spreadsheets and I asked for uh, where your project was. Because I think regionally it's quite important. There were regional differences. How much did your project cost? Um, was it rural? Was it urban? Um, how much did it cost to deposit physically? How much did it cost to deposit digitally? If you did, how many boxes there were, you know, and any key factors, like I said, if there was something unusual, like waterlogged or whatever it was. And um, I got information back on 257 individual projects, which I think is amazing. Uh, nine regions, some units, as I said, gave me lots and lots of information on their archive, but refused to give me the original cost of their project. So I couldn't really use their data because I couldn't figure out what that meant. You know, I didn't, I didn't have um, anything to balance it on. And we had a whole range of projects from the really tiny to the really big, which was great. So when I drilled that down, I actually had comparable data on, for physical deposition. So when you take your boxes to the museum or the repository for 151 projects, for digital deposition, 108. And when I knew this is my total archiving cost for 158 projects. The reason all those numbers are slightly different is obviously some projects are digital only deposition, some projects are physical only deposition, some overlap. Some projects probably would have had a digital component but were actually tendered for and we undertook them before there was a requirement for digital deposition. So even though they probably should have done, it wasn't. So, you know, this is where there's all these imbalances. As I said, lots of caveats with this data, but I think it gives us the best idea we've got about what we're currently spending on archiving. So I'm, going to, I'm not going to cover all the information on all of these slides because it's too much. One thing we did ask every unit who responded is annually, for a couple of years, what have you spent as an organisation on archiving? In your commercial unit, what have you spent on archiving together? And the absolute maximum has been spent by you is less than 0.5% of their annual turnover. To figure that out, we went to obviously Companies House and the Charities Commission. Once again, caveats with that. Some units, I couldn't get that information because they're part of councils and you just can't pull the information out about their annual turnover. So for the information we did have, this is what we came down to. So obviously the absolute maximum anyone spending is uh, less than 0.5% of their annual turnover on archiving. I'll come back to why that's important in a bit. Now, box deposition fees. It's always been the question that's going on, I was like, what are we actually spending at the moment? And as you can see, it ranges from roughly, because I figured out what the archive was and how many boxes that equated to, from £26 up to £132 in London, which is interesting because across the country, now museums have all put their box fees up. The average is around £100 a box, which suggests that currently today, as a sector, we are still not depositing boxes at the current rate. There's reasons for that. We're depositing archives from three, four, five, 10, 15 years ago. We've probably not got through the system to be depositing the boxes from the last couple of years because they're still going through the process of post-excavation. Um, 
Some places, obviously my data is a bit skewed. For example, in Yorkshire, we all know that the box fees have gone up to about £320 a box. So either I just haven't got enough data from people depositing there, because some people won't give me, or it just hasn't got through yet. People still are depositing at the old levels. So the other caveat I have with this data is that the figures I've got aren't actually based on current deposition fees. And if you think about digital, a lot of people still aren't depositing digital archives because it's only been an actual requirements coming through tenders for the past couple of years. So, you know, we have, this is where a bit of the lag comes in. So then I thought if I look at actual current standards, as in what we should be paying if we were paying current fees, what does that look like? So we've got all the information off all the local museums, got their box fees, and looked at what that would equate to as a meter squared. Because the other argument I hear is, so-and-so's box in whatever region is twice the size of this box, and I'm paying £100 here and £100 here, but I can get twice as much material. So therefore, we look at the uh, meter cubage, and the range is insane. So it goes from around £1,000 per meter cubed up to £16,000 a meter cubed. So it just shows the complete difference that you can be paying depending on where you are working in the country, which we all know can be quite a nightmare to explain to clients when they've worked in two regions and they just don't understand why, where that discrepancy is coming from. But it does give us this rough average of £108 a box. So we are close to that current you know, average across the country of £100 and um, 5344 pounds per square meter. So at least we've, we're starting to get the figures to think about as in what is it, what are we currently basing on? But all these figures, the other thing to think about is they're also varied, they're also different. They change across the country because everyone's kind of just come up with it themselves. It's not really based on anything. It's, we all know it's messed up. So even though we've got all these averages, they're still based on quite a variety of things that really don't have a lot of basis of reasoning of why someone's charging something and someone else is charging something completely different. I crunched this number, these numbers in so many different ways. And I, there's so many different ways to think about it, thinking about it regionally per project. And you come up with lots of different figures. But, and I'll go into that in more detail if you come to the workshops. <laughs> but I think when it comes down to it, the best way to figure out what we're spending nationally is to look on what we're spending on certain sizes of project. So I looked at projects that were up to £10,000, you know, your small, small scale watching briefs or evaluations, and then did um, larger projects up to 100000 up to 1 million, and then the really large projects. And as you can see from this data, that brings down a lot closer. I did it, I was average all of them by project, the data's a lot clearer, and then I kind of weighted it at the end as what I think we're spending. But I think what you can see from this data is we are spending significantly more on smaller projects than we are on large projects. Like as an average of what the original project cost compared to what we're spending on depositing this material in perpetuity for the long core good of the public and all that kind of stuff, it's significantly more. And if you think about your small watching brief that you've done that returned very little in the way of archaeological evidence and the percentage of your project cost you're spending on archiving compared to your huge urban excavation that revealed some new amazing knowledge and you've got finds in the museums and you've got publications out and what we're spending on the long-term care and curation of that material it's a lot smaller. So there seems to be quite a big discrepancy at the moment about what we're paying out as a sector and what, for example, developers are paying to support the long-term care and curation of the material that's being produced. And I then took all of these numbers and I averaged them out. And I think this last graph is the, is the best case average of what we are currently paying for archiving. So as a percentage of our overall projects. So it's 1.78% for physical deposition of the overall projects of the overall project cost, we're paying more out for digital, which I think is quite interesting. And um, on average, we're paying about 3.56% per project um, on, on um, currently of uh, what we're paying out. So this is just my little summarized slide. We are just to drive home the different amounts we're paying for types of deposition and the fact we are paying so much more for smaller projects. Larger projects are costing us a lot less to archive, though arguably would potentially have more long-term impact for research, for public output, for engagement, for potential um, future reuse. And we're paying more for digital. 
And as I've said, these figures are based on what we're currently paying, which is we are not paying the current deposition fees. So I took everyone's data and in, I changed it all and I applied. I imagine that if we were all depositing at £100 a box fee for all these projects we've been depositing, and we all were depositing at least a basic ADS easy deposition. Now, obviously, some we don't pay any digital archiving costs because they're not worth it, just goes to ACs. Some, I would argue, should be a lot more than £230 to deposit digitally. But I just applied um, £230 ADS easy fee to every project. Um, and I added that cost to the original project cost. And I imagined that everyone attended properly for their archiving at the outset of the project and figured out what the percentage would be. And as you can see, <laughs> It's really high. So the suggestion was that for the small projects, the genuine cost of archiving and depositing properly would be nearly 10% of your original um, project costs. And it drops down for the larger projects and the ones um, that are between 100,000 to a million is about 1.55%. But if you just, and then I weighted that and I came up with the overall average, if we were paying at current archiving fees, for the projects I had the information on, the 270 projects, it should be costing us about 6.87% of our overall project costs per project to deposit. Now, if you consider that 6.87% and go back to one of the first figures I gave you, which is what we are spending as a sector, generally as our percentage of annual turnover is less than 0.5% at the most, at the very most, on archiving, and if you think about what percentage of your annual turnover comes from developer-funded work, and I would argue for the most of our sector, it's the large majority of our income. Some people do other stuff, you know, like community-based stuff, but for the large majority of our sector, we, our income comes through developer-funded work through the planning sector. If we are currently spending less than 0.5%, but genuinely, the genuine current cost should be nearly 7%, I would ask you, do you have 7% in your surplus at the end of your year, which you should have to cover the costs of archiving? And according to Companies House and the Charities Commission, I couldn't find a single company who had that surplus in their books to cover the genuine cost of archiving as it stands at the moment. And so from all of this, what we want to drive home is the current system doesn't work. The system whereby we pay for archiving at the end of the project, maybe a year after the end, maybe 20 years after the end, however this happens, it doesn't work. We are not covering the costs up front. We are not um, either explaining to our clients properly what the genuine cost of archiving could be, or as I hear anecdotally, because no one will write it down, they just come and tell me afterwards, all the archiving costs money was spent during post text or we found something interesting, we've spent the money elsewhere, or oh, it happened 20 years ago and it's just got kind of lost in the slush, so we've run out of money. So there are many reasons. There's also museums have closed, so we couldn't archive with them anyway. So we just, you know, the money just went on other things. There are a multitude of reasons why, but it still doesn't change the fact that we are not as a sector properly budgeting for the current cost of archiving. Now, Amanda's going to go and go through with some solutions to this. But one thing I'd also say is this figure of nearly 7%, it's based on the current situation of many, many ways of archiving, different museums, everyone coming up with their own plan, everyone coming up with their own costing structure without it really being based in fact. So we think that it doesn't have to be this much. <laughs> and we're going to go through why now. <laughs> yes. So... Um, and as Sam said, so that 7% is the deposition fee. That isn't even the cost of yeah. preparing yeah. your archive. I'm literally talking <laughs> about depositing. Costs. I'm not talking about what you do in-house with your post -ex. That's your own thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so again, numbers, where do we get the numbers from? So when we're looking at sector costs, can we raise the kind of revenue needed to have a different system and, and kind of move away from the one that we're in at the moment? We have got some really good numbers. We've got profile in the profession that looks back over a number of years. Um, CIFA have been really um, helpful and collect data, obviously, about size of organisations. And we've got Oasis, which is a really good source now that we've got Oasis 5, because it's actually query, you know, you can actually ask it for information about stuff. So we're not working completely blind with this. We know how big the sector is. We know how much 
um, what percentage of work we do is turnover from development, for example. And we know how much of that happens in England. So, you know, it's not a completely like, let's just make up some numbers, um, we promise. Um, so we, so the, the, the workshop that we did uh, back at CIFA and the workshops we will be doing online, we're going to look at these model ideas in more detail. And we're basically doing a really simple SWOT analysis of just like, how do we all feel about this collectively as a sector? Um, We've put how we feel about them in little yellow emojis <laughs> at the bottom, just to be kind of subtle. Uh, box charges, they just don't work. We don't care if you like it. It doesn't work. So let's move on. Project percentage. This is the one that we think, ah, actually, could this work? So if when we tendered for the work that we're doing at the beginning, we know that we need to put in 7% of that total field work cost, to go for deposition fees, or maybe it could be even less than that because we're all doing it at the beginning of a project in a consistent way. Um, could that money then go straight to a contribution to this national archive collection? It's got nothing to do with the number of boxes. It hasn't got anything to do with the volume of fines. It's got to do with a contribution from the impact of the development to the store that makes this all work. So it's always there. It's like your pension scheme for boxes. <laughs> Think of it in that way. What you're paying for today is to make sure there is a shelf when you get to the end of the project and there's no mess, there's no confusion. You don't have to think, oh, I can't even get that box size anymore. You know, it's all kind of consistent. I'm not saying it wouldn't be perfect, of course, but um, there are ways of doing it. We thought about maybe could you do it on a turnover levy? So thinking about that 0.5% of your annual turnover, it gets really complicated when you start thinking about that. So we think that's too complex and also feels unfair. So if you're an organisation that, for example, I don't know, like Dig Ventures, we don't do a lot of development funded work. Would we have to pay the same as everybody else to support that, to make sure that there was a, a shelf for our boxes to go on? So we think that gets a little bit too complicated. Um, and then development levy. It's not quite as laughing. We're just like, well, how would this work? Like, so think about... The, the planning application stage, before we get involved, our curator, John, <laughs> in the room, would be the person that needs to say, oh, this is the size of the archaeology. I think this whole development needs to make a contribution of this size to the national collection before it gets to the contract estate. I mean, is that going to look at John's face? It's like, <laughs> he's laughing. That's why we put it on there. Um, so... <laughs> So th these are the types of models we're discussing. We haven't made any decisions about this, and that's what the workshops are going to do. So the next stage for us is to go through those SWOT analysis, which we did with um, uh, people at the, the conference, and I think we had about 50 people in that session. So it was a good kind of an idea scrubbing way. The, the ideas that we think will work, could they work? The, the, the percentage we're talking about, do they feel okay? Do they feel scary? Do they feel enough? Um, is it something we're just assuming like, oh, well, everybody can just put that on at tender stage and if everybody's doing it, it's a level playing field. Is that right? Does it feel like it is? The one big takeaway, two actually, one big takeaway in the pink box, box fees do not work. <laughs> they don't cover the costs. They don't serve the sector well. They're painful for us and they're painful for museums because by the time sometimes we get to deposition, they're the fees of 10 years ago, and yeah. it's not really covering the cost. And actually, the consultation that we did with museums in both projects, when we asked, does your box fee cover that in perpetuity, um, looking after maintenance, everything else? No, no, it never does. And actually, when you ask people, what should it be? Well, I'd probably like £450, at least £500. If we then had to start paying that as a deposition fee, well, that doesn't feel like it's going to work either. So it's, it's removing the link between um, the, the place where we put our archives and where they're looked after and made accessible and, and de-linking it from the number of boxes and what's in the boxes and the fee we pay. What we want to say is the NCAA, we think, is a really good idea. We think it'd be useful. We think it would solve a lot of problems. It would deal with all that legacy material. But what we then pay for it in active projects has to be about sustaining an infrastructure of the thing just being there and accessible and useful to us as a sector. So having the data store, 
having the advisors to help support things, maintaining the link between museums that do want to be part of this national collecting network um, and the contractors and everybody that's working within this environment as well. But also somewhere that researchers can go and easily get access to boxes and material, somewhere that you can search digitally and query. And think about the um, PAS database, for example, and how useful that is to just look at, you know, how many medieval mounts there were from this region. You could do that with all the archaeological archives one day, way in the future, yeah. but it could be a research tool in its own right. So we're not being subtle. We don't like the box fee. <laughs> we do really like the idea of the NCA, but we do need to find a sustainable way to raise that revenue. If we're talking about everybody doing the same system in England for every development-led project, that 7%, 6.87% percentage that's linked to what we understand about boxes, we think that would come down. So we think actually that would be more um, reachable. It wouldn't feel like such a big footprint of a project. The other thing that we've subtly done, and nobody's perhaps noticed, is we're talking about physical and digital together. We weren't asked to at the no. beginning, but having worked on digital archives quite a lot as well, I do think it would be remiss not to think about them together because that is what we do we do think about them and they are infrastructure project and, and where you've got repositories like ads or other repositories which may well get caught a seal and pop up across regions in england they would just act like any other museum that would be part of the network so it isn't beyond the scope of what we're talking about to deal with both at the same time so Come to the sessions. We've added a few more places because they like, tickets flew off the shelves. <laughs> it's amazing how much people want to talk about this. Um, we definitely have spaces on the consultants one, so that's the end of next week. We've got four or five places on each. We've also got waiting lists now as well. So if you do want to be part of this um, ongoing conversation, if you can't make any of these and you've got ideas and you do want to talk about it, just get in touch with us um, because we do want to hear them.